You're all good to go, Jeffrey. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, and welcome to Manhattan Community Board's um, January 22 full board meeting. Uh, my name is Jeffrey LeFrancois, and it is a distinct privilege to be calling this meeting to order this evening as chair. I'm honored and delighted welcome to be stepping into this role. Hey. I look forward to continuing the good work. Hey, of this um, good evening, welcome everybody. My, uh, and welcome to Manhattan. Fellow executive officers. Now, I promised our great district manager I would not start off tonight's meetings with my list of grievances and keep these remarks to under 45 minutes. But many of you know that I can speak passionately and have conviction in my beliefs. I also have great respect for process, coalition building, structure, and listening, all attributes that this board has long embodied. And so I take all of that very seriously in this role. While many of my CB4 colleagues are aware of this, I want the public to know that I am executive director of the Meatpacking Business Improvement District. When items come before the board within the bid boundaries, I will continue to vote present, not eligible. And there may be times I pass an item off to the first or second vice chair to handle it if it's within the bid boundaries. If anyone has any questions about this, they can reach out to the board office and we're happy to answer any questions. Now, tonight's meeting is coming on the heels of an historic day in the state and city of New York. This afternoon, the city council elected Adrian Adams of Queens to be the council speaker. And she will be the first African-American speaker of the majority female city council. And up north in Albany, Governor Hat Kathy Hochul gave her first state of the state address for New York, marking another first as a female governor for the state of New York. And here we are down at CB4, we've got important local business to tend to which tonight includes a public hearing on rat conditions in the neighborhood. So full spectrum of importance in our communities and history being made. Um, I would note that we were supposed to have a presentation by the New York City Racial Justice Commission. However, um, we're gonna postpone that until February, giving some scheduling issues um, with the commission and our agenda this evening. So flagging that for folks now. And now formally, this meeting is taking place by the order of Governor Kathy Hochul as in-person meeting requirements of the open meetings law um, have been suspended through January 15th, 2022. All of our committee and full board meetings will be held virtually via Zoom until further notice. This meeting is being streamed live on our YouTube channel and a transcript is being recorded, a copy of which can be made available to any member of the media for cablecast or broadcasting. As is our standard, members of the public will be given the ability to speak during the public session by signing up in advance on our website. However, if there are any members of the public attending who would like to speak and did not sign up in advance, please use the raise hand function on Zoom when the public session starts. If you are calling in by phone, you'll need to press star six. The agenda for tonight's meeting can be found on our website at mcb4.nyc. Um, that concludes my formal introduction. Mr. District Manager, did I miss anything there? Very good. Cool. So then with that, I'm going to pass it over to Jesse and to Blake to open our public hearing on rat conditions in Community Board 4. Blake, do you want to do an introduction of the, sure. uh, of the topic? Yeah, thanks, um, Jeffrey and Jesse. Uh, so we are having a public hearing tonight on rat conditions. And I think this has been something that we've seen in the news, heard from a lot of residents. And so our board's uh, arts, culture, street life committee at our last meeting heard from the Department of Health on some of the measures being taken to do more rat inspections, uh, moving back some of the folks that had been on COVID uh, control duties back into rat inspections. But this is still an area that you know, I think we can provide some additional feedback uh, as well as producing uh, reports to 311 about areas specific to our neighborhood that uh, might be particularly problematic and need to be inspected. So that, uh, you know, was the genesis of this um, public hearing. And I think we have a few folks that are signed up to speak. Thanks, Blake. Jesse, are those folks with us this evening? Yeah, they are. So I'm going to bring, uh, I'm going to start bringing them over. The first one is going to be uh, Fern Lutsky. Uh, oh, and I see Peggy Ko from our board who's over in attendees as well. Um, uh, and then I'll start bringing you over the other folks, but Fern, you'll be the first, okay? And then Rick Foud, that's right. So everybody has two minutes to speak. Uh, Fern, are you with us? Uh, 
from you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, Fern. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm speak Fern Luskin. I'm speaking on behalf of my immediate neighbors on West 29th Street and also concerned residents of Penn Plaza. Uh, the, the, the rat the rat infestation has been going on for at least one and a half years. It's ever since the pandemic erupted and the rats are still here. We have had rat meetings with neighbors, letter, written letters to electeds, including Corey Johnson and also um, Gail Brewer, and who have tried to take action. Uh, we, Corey Johnson even arranged to have a walkthrough uh, on the block and with uh, twice now and with a sanitation official. We've written a petition. It's on I petitions, rat proof our city with new garbage collection. Um, there was a two part series in Chelsea community news about it. And still all that, and it's only slightly abated. And, but come spring at the rate of rat reproduction will be inundated all over again. So uh, the rat abatement and the sanitation procedures just have to change. There, you know, we have this massive infestation on my block and elsewhere, as you know, but especially it could be on my block why it's really grievous is because of the front yard gardens and the rats have dug tunnels through them, through the concrete. Anyway, there is this massive infestation and it shouldn't be up to the owners and the tenants to deal with it. It's an emergency that the city must respond to with a massive extermination using dry ice. It worked in Boston, why can't it work for us? Um, currently health department enforcement gives owners many chances to comply over many months and they can't even always track down the owners. Others don't comply, like the owner of the Hopper Gibbons house, the Underground Railroad station on West 29th between 8th and 9th. And I mean, the amount of rat burrows that the health department inspectors found there was something, an incredible number, like 27 or something. And the feces are still there. And I noticed, I just looked up on the rat portal um, that they, did, the owner did put down rat bait, but I'm telling you, I go out there often at night and I, or, and during the day, I see no rat bait station, but I do see the rats. I even videotape them. Burn, you have um, about 10 seconds. Oh, okay. All right. We got to stop with the black plastic garbage bags uh, being left out at night and the, the garbage and litter must be picked up regularly. It has not been on my block. There's still a lot of organic garbage in the park at 9th and 28th Street. Um, and am I still on? Uh, yeah, you, got, okay. you need to wrap it up, friend. Thank you. All right, last thing, with the restaurant sheds, they got, in Europe, they put the uh, shed, there, there are no sheds, they, there's a covering, but the tables are on the sidewalk, not on wooden platforms. The wooden platforms provide rats with a golden opportunity of plentiful food above the platform and a cushy space for sleeping underneath it. Thank you, Fern. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rick, are you with us? Uh, I am. My right. turn? Yep, your turn. Two okay. Minutes. It won't even take two minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at this um, forum. I have no clue how New York City government works, so this is all, uh, you know, first time for me. Uh, I live at uh, 57th Street and 8th Avenue, and um, it, it is a rat problem, but to me, it's more of a garbage problem that creates a rat problem. And the one thing I would point out is that at our corner, uh, right below us, the subway station, a business uh, entity created you know, a wonderful set of shops, but what it's turned into is there are about 20 eating establishments below uh, ground. And they simply take all of their garbage bags and dump them on the corner. And they sit there until the trash haulers come by. What they've effectively done is turn that corner into a kind of landfill. It's a horror show. And 
it, you know, it might as well have a sign out there, rats, please come and, you know, feast. It's a catastrophe. And the idea that they simply take all their trash and put it upstairs on the sidewalk is untenable and unacceptable. And as I was observing this, I realized that, you know, we have additional restaurants slash, uh, you know, food establishments that are doing similar things. And what I would like to see is that this cease immediately. Uh, vendors and restaurants shouldn't be able to put trash bags out there and just leave them. They should contract with waste haulers so that when the waste haulers arrive, they place their garbage bags onto the truck and that's it. Our corners and sidewalks should not be turned into makeshift uh, you know, garbage dumps. And that's what they're becoming. And that to me is you know, really the main issue with this rat infestation. It's a horrible thing and it has to be addressed. And I, it should be done at city government level. It's all I have to say. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk. Thank you, thank you, Rick. Um, the third person that was on our list is actually not here. So that closes out the hearing on rat conditions. Um, uh, Jesse, I think there might've been one more in the public session list that was about rats. Should we? Um... I'm happy to bring her over if that's Dolores uh, Nagashima. I'm happy to bring her over if that's if you like. Dolores, are you with us? No, oh, no, she's still over there. Hold on. Hi, Dolores, are you with us? She's currently muted, Dolores. Dolores, you have to unmute yourself. I can't unmute you. <clears throat> All right. Um, Maybe if she shows back up during the regular public session, Jesse, which we're about to. Yeah, I'll leave her. To. I'll leave her here, and so she can, if she get allowed, if she gets unmuted, she can she can speak. Um, but that, that, I think then we're, we're done with the hearing. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Thank you. Moving forward uh, on the agenda, as I mentioned, the presentation we were supposed to have this evening from the NYC Racial Justice Commission, we're gonna um, hold over until February. Um, so we'll be taking that up then. So given that, I'm gonna be passing um, the gavel over to our first vice chair, um, Jessica Chait, who will run the public session. Jessica? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and great to see everyone. Happy New Year. Um, as many of you know, our custom is to uh, have an advanced sign up for the uh, open session. People are allotted two minutes. We do have a number of individuals who have signed up, but Jesse, I'm actually not seeing them um, in, in, in our attendees. Yeah, um, I'm not seeing them either. Um, I'm going through them. Maybe we can just remind Dolores how to unmute because it looks like she's not on the video component and, and in doing so, can you remind me how? Sure, how Dolores, you, uh, you just need to push star six if you're using your phone to unmute, or if you are on the video, uh, on the bottom of your screen, there should be a, a microphone. You can just press that and that would allow you to speak. Um, but seeing that she's not, able to join us um, and the other attendees or the other sign, sign people who signed up are not uh, with us. I, unless there's anyone who's raised a hand, which I'm not seeing. I think you have Lisa Wager. Yeah, Lisa Wager from FIT is here. So I'm, let me bring her over. Sure. And I think we have one other person that raised her hand. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Lisa, you with us? I am in spirit and uh, there. So there you uh, are. Uh, I'm Lisa Wager, the director of government community relations at the Fashion Institute of Technology, SUNY College, 27th Street. I just want to say Happy New Year. 
Uh, the college has gone back on remote status. We're open, but nobody's in the building. And um, I really just want to commend the leadership that um, Community Board 4 has had uh, basically always since I've started coming quite a while ago and um, expressed my great excitement at uh, Jeffrey's uh, new role and um, also Jessica and Leslie. And um, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. So happy new year, everyone. And I'm glad to be here and to see all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and Jesse, do we have one more person you said whose hand is raised? Uh, yeah, we have, um, I, 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 I apologize if I mispronounce this, uh, Tingy Hu. All right, well, welcome. And we'll give you two minutes. Yes, hi, how are you, uh, everyone? Happy New Year. Thank you for having us here. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yes, um, I'm just a, a backup and supporter uh, for the CPP uh, board member that uh, Rick and um, Dolores and signed I up. I unmuted. Uh, okay, great. I'm here. I'm I finally found it. <laughs> okay. I was helping her I, I back up. technical problem. Okay, I'll mute myself. Dolores, speak up. Somebody's speaking. Am uh, I supposed to speak? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. If team, you're okay sorry, with that, go ahead, Dolores. Uh, That's okay. We'll give you your two minutes starting that now. Rick does, and Rick said it all very uh, elegantly that we really have an urgent problem here with the rats, and something must be done because. One of the doormen told me they're coming right up to the windows of our doors. They're coming from 309. And they're coming from uh, the building next door, 309, 309 West, West 57, because they parked their garbage in a uh, downstairs in a courtyard or something, and uh, the rats get there. And also uh, the homeless. We have homeless on our street, and they're cutting into the bags, and then, of course, the rats get in there, too. And the bags are left over the holidays, and one uh, pile of bags is there from before New Year's Eve. So uh, it's still there on the sidewalk. I don't understand how they're getting away with it. We think that the city do not pick it up because it should be picked by commercial sanitation, and they don't have sanit commercial sanitation to pick it up. So we have garbage sitting here for one week without being picked up. It's all ripped out by uh, homeless and rats that they're cutting out the black bags. They're coming out from 309 West. The doorman told us that they, uh, they see them. And we see the rats running right on the street. They don't even try to hide. They are running right to us, running under the under the cars. The, the, it's, it's like, it's worse than Bombay if they can cut Calcutta. It's so bad that something has to be done. I don't know who can do it, what can be done, but it's it's terrible. And I hope some I hope someone can help us because I went out seven thirty in the morning and the rats ran right under my legs. So there you go. What Thank can you. we do about this situation? Thank you, Dolores. So I'm not sure if you heard, but we, we, you know, as part of this public hearing, we have written a letter which will be presented later in this meeting. Um, as Blake mentioned, this is something we've been exploring uh, very seriously and, and take very seriously with our local elected officials, making sure that we get the needed resources to our community. Um, so hopefully we have your contact information. I'm sure we've captured the address that you just provided and uh, we'll look to get to this. Tingy, did you want to also speak on this? Thank you, um, Jessica. Um, um, I, I'm just uh, no, just uh, uh, supporting my uh, my board members and uh, neighbors. Um, there's some problem in just uh, being more and more serious as in they stated because uh, of also the holiday and the new tourists. And it's a very busy section, if intersection really. Um, and then, you know, the, the uh, irresponsibility of the commercial garbage that piling up uh, not only to ruin the sanitation, you know, the in the san sanitation of the environment, but also, you know, it really, um, how do I adjust this? This congested more of the pedestrian traffic. You know, it's an even put a more danger to you know all people passing around and uh, um, causing more 
more and more problem and also with the rats. Thank you, Tingy. We, Thank you. We appreciate appreciate you guys coming and sharing your concerns today. I do think that is everyone. I just checked, Jesse. I'm not seeing anyone else having had joined who signed up. Um, Pamela Wolf was the last person I brought over, and I th- we're, we're, we can end it then. Sure. Okay. Pamela, Thank go you, ahead. everyone. So I like being the one who gets the last word. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> I just have very little to say other than happy new new year to everyone congratulations to the new officers and i just i'm glad to see my face on the screen for a few minutes thanks thank you happy new year okay to you that that concludes our public session thank you everyone thank you jessica um moving to the next item on our agenda um, is, is actually the adoption of the agenda. And I would note um, that there is one transportation item that is being tabled for the evening. Uh, does anybody have any questions or any further amendments to the agenda? Hearing none, I'll take a motion to adopt the agenda as, as proposed. Moved. Moved to adopt. Is there a second? Second. Great, any objections? The agenda is adopted. <clears throat> Moving on to the minutes. Um, are there any questions on the minutes? Great, hearing none, I'll take a motion to adopt the minutes. I'd like to make a motion that we pass minutes. Thanks, Rob, is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you, any objections? The minutes are adopted. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to give a shout out to our outgoing secretary, Mr. Mike Noble, and would like to welcome uh, Blake Kirisu and Katie Stokes, who are our new co-secretaries. Um, and of course, also give a shout out to our executive officer, uh, Leslie Murphy, um, who was previously a co-secretary and now she is our second vice chair. So that rounds out our executive uh, suite of officers uh, for CB4 uh, for this year. So now I lost one of my tabs. I got to get my groove on this stuff. Um, with that, um, I go to reports uh, from our borough president. Is our new borough president, um, the Honorable Mark Levine, with us yet this evening? Hi, folks. Uh, I am not Mark Levine. I'm Trisha Shimamura. I'm uh, your new director of community affairs. Mark is on his way. He's just finishing up with another another meeting. So stay tuned. He'll be here. He's at about 10 minutes or so. Perfect. Thanks for that, Trisha, and welcome to you as well. Great to have you tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have any other elect? Ah, I see a hand of another new elected official this evening. Our esteemed new council member, the Honorable Eric Botcher, is with us this evening. Mr. Botcher. Hi, everybody. Hi, Eric. Am I on? Hey, everyone. Great to see everyone. I'm here from our very empty district office on 30th Street. This is my first uh, CB4 meeting as an elected official, and I'm so excited to be here with you. So many old friends. I just came from City Hall where we elected uh, Adrian Adams as a speaker, the first African-American speaker of the city council and uh, the first uh, majority female city council in the history of New York and apparently the country. I mean, it's really an incredible time in New York City. And I wanna take a moment before I continue to acknowledge uh, Lowell Kern. And, uh, you know, I assume that he was lauded at the last meeting of the year, but since I'm here, I just wanna thank uh, you, Lowell, for your service and say to Jeffrey how much I'm looking forward to working with you and the rest of you at the board. And here's the role that I envision for myself. I envision myself as a partner to you at Community Board 4 to sit down with you, take the plans that you've put together, the uh, address the issues that we're dealing with and go to the Adams administration. The, I've worked really hard to develop a, a good relationship with Eric Adams and his team 
because I really feel like in the, the previous administration, we were reactive. We were being uh, just handed plans and in, in a, in a uh, reactive position, but wh whether it's uh, the sanitation issue, I've asked to uh, chair the sanitation committee. We'll see in the next couple of weeks if that happens, uh, but it's a very important issue. When we talk about things like uh, rodents, the only way to really address it is through sanitation, universal composting, getting the organic waste out of these bags that we put out on the sidewalk, which are basically like buffets for rats. We have to really uh, uh, make huge changes. I see Christine Berté uh, here. Uh, Community Board 4 has produced some extremely thoughtful, innovative proposals. Let's take them to the Adams administration, work with them to get them implemented. We put together a, a really incredible team. I'm so proud of the team that we've put together here. Uh, Jordan Finer is staying on with me as my community board for liaison. I'm very excited for that. Uh, my chief of staff is on tonight, Sean Coughlin, a resident of 49th Street. And I have an incredible new legislative and budget director, Wynne Periasami, who is a resident of 48th and 9th. So uh, I believe our, our whole staff lives in Council District 3. So we're on the ground. We are your neighbors. Uh, we are here to serve you. We are public servants here to serve you and work very closely with you. And I really believe that this is a time of immense opportunity with a new mayor, new governor, new city council, new borough president, new district attorney, new controller. I believe we have a real opportunity to make big changes because the status quo is not acceptable to me, whether it's sanitation, affordable housing, we are not producing anywhere near the amount of affordable housing that we need to produce. When we look at, when we talk about the projects that are coming down the pike, 100 units here, 100 units there, we have to do much better. So I really look forward to sitting down with you and coming up with plans for more affordable housing, bringing it to the Adams administration and seeing that uh, get implemented. So I'm really excited to working with you, uh, be on the ground with you. And thank you all for your service on Community Board 4. Thanks to the new members. I see some new faces. I see Jesse Greenwald, uh, my neighbor down in Chelsea here. So thank you so much, everyone, uh, for having me tonight. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, we're very much looking forward uh, to working with you uh, in the time ahead, for sure. It's, exci it's exciting times in the city of New York. Um, Jesse, is there anybody? Yeah. We have no, no, no. Uh, well, we, we have uh, folks from Dick Godfrey's office uh, in the attendee section. I don't know if they're. I believe I believe Dick is coming. I, I'm um, sure. I, I think sure. everybody's timing is off a little bit because that you know our, our public hearing. Uh, excuse me, the uh, presentation um, isn't happening. So should I jump to my uh, chair's report and we can come back to the electeds? Why not? Okay. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, so just some formal well, update. I, actually, I think technically I'm supposed to go before you. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's completely fine. Manager. <laughs> I know everybody was in, in, waiting in anticipation to hear my report. So um, uh, give me one second. Uh, Real, real quickly, um, just a reminder for everybody that the for January committee schedule that the Chelsea Land Use Committee will be meeting on Tuesday, January 18th, not their normal day, which is the day before uh, due to the Martin Luther King uh, Jr. holiday. And then the Social and Racial Justice Task Force will be meeting on Tuesday, uh, January 25th at 6.30 p.m. All other committees are meeting at their regular scheduled time. Uh, we're going to extend the CB4 virtual drive that we uh, sent out uh, prior to the holidays for one to the end of this week. Uh, and uh, there's you can find creative ways to donate um, 
actual I particular items off of wish lists for a number of the nonprofit and social service organizations in our district. It's on our website, so I would highly, uh, uh, if you still haven't uh, got a chance to look at it, please do. And uh, that's it. Thanks, Jesse. So from um, your chair's report, chair report and small meeting report, um, a couple of updates and some changes. Um, as I now step into the role of chair, um, I am no longer a formal member of committees. So I'm very, and I was a former co-chair of the Waterfront Parks and Environment Committee. So accordingly, um, I am very pleased to announce that the new co-chair joining Marty DeCat at WPE is going to be Leslie Bogosian Murphy. Um, he'll be stepping into that role, so very excited for that. Leslie, thank you for stepping in and co-chairing WPE. I promised her I wouldn't be going away, though. Um, and then... Um, oh, I know, Jeffrey. I hope <laughs> not. <laughs> um, and then, of course, um, Lowell Kern, our esteemed, my immediate predecessor and esteemed former chair, um, will be returning as a member to WPE and also to Chelsea Land Use um, as members. I'm also pleased to announce that we have a new public member who's been appointed to the Housing, Health and Human Services Committee. His name is Travis Rogers, and I believe he was appointed back in November or December. Um, and so excited to have him um, joining as a public member on HHH and S. On small meetings and ongoing working groups, um, the Penn Station Area Civic and Land Use Project Working Group um, is that work is continuing. Um, there has not been any uh, formal meetings in the past uh, since our last meeting. Of course, also the Port Authority Bus Terminal Replacement Working Group, um, that work continues um, as well. Nothing too formal to report there. Bert, is there anything you'd like to flag accordingly? Okay. Um, just to jump back to the Penn Station thing, if I may, for a moment. Um, the work is continuing. Uh, um, it is a group on, on CB4 as well as CB5. Um, there's a working group. Uh, we're advocating aggressively to get started on what's being called the Penn Station Advisory Group, where hopefully there's a group of folks who come together and can really be at the table to advise on what actually can happen in Penn Station, not around Penn Station. Um, and so we hope to continue much work on that um, in the year ahead. The, let's see, Chel um, Clinton Health Kitchen land use, um, working with the borough president, they were able to get City Hall and EDC to agree to making all the units. Uh, this is sort of um, like really exciting news. Many may recall the slaughterhouse site over on 11th Avenue. Um, the Clinton Health Kitchen land use committee worked really hard with um, the borough president's office in City Hall and EDC to agree to making all of the affordable units at Slaughterhouse site permanently affordable. Um, this is a great win um, for us and the community at this site. Yes, lots of silent props on that. Um, and of course, this is, this is years in the making so that this is gonna become a reality is very exciting. Um, for HHHS, they provided testimony at the mayor's office of contracts uh, on hearings for the two proposed DHS facilities in our district. Uh, a proposed drop-in center at 771 9th Avenue at 52nd Street, and the extension of the emergency contract for stabilization beds at the Long Acre or also the Aladdin Hotel at 317 West 45th Street. And we are the committee is continuing to meet with Mount Sinai West regarding the reopening of the detox unit um, at the hospital. Jesse, anything else to, that I missed there? No, you did. That's great. I, I did okay. just see our borough president, but then they he seemed to have disappeared. I, I don't know where he... Oh, there he is. Is he back? Oh, ah. he, got hand back. he got his hand back. I am oh, um, delighted and very pleased to welcome another new elected official to our roster this evening, um, our borough president, the Honorable Mark Levine. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Honorable Chair LeFrancois. Thank great you, to see you, Honorable Chair Kern. For uh, for his his outstanding service, I am so excited to work with all of you here at CB4 uh, as your new borough president. Just five days on the job so far, coming to you from uh, the David and Dinkins office building uh, at at a moment which I think we can all agree is a crisis for 
CB4 for Manhattan, for New York City. Uh, comparable in scale, I think, in recent memory, only to the days following 9-11. And uh, I'm going to put the full power of this office into bringing about a comeback from Manhattan, from the public health crisis, uh, from the profound inequality, which has been revealed and exacerbated over the past year, um, the economic shock, which has impacted uh, small business and tourism and the arts community and nonprofits um, and in-person office work and so much more. Uh, to be able to deal with those big problems, what is clear is that we have to manage this pandemic to the point where it is no longer a crisis, which is so terribly disrupting our life. I don't think any of us uh, dare to even fear that we would be going into a third year of this pandemic um, with yet another difficult wave as we began 2022. Um, and it, it is a difficult wave uh, with, with 40,000 cases or more. Um, and in fact, many neighborhoods in CB4 were the first to really start getting hit hard in the Omicron wave, really beginning about three weeks ago. And, and now, um, hopefully in, in, in a more positive sign for the rest of the city, seem to be leveling off. We're seeing some stabilization in positivity rates in CB4, which I'm, I'm hopeful of. Uh, but, but make no mistake, hospitalizations are growing. ICU uh, census is growing. Um, and we're still seeing today, we saw 42,000 COVID cases in New York City. So um, we have more work to do uh, uh, to keep each other safe um, during this difficult time. And actually, I put out a 16-point COVID action plan uh, on Monday, which I won't, I won't detail, but among other things called for uh, expansion and access to self-test resources so that everyone can simply apply to have one sent to their home for free. This is done in other parts of the country and world. Uh, this will be a great way to give people an alternative uh, to waiting hours in line for testing. Uh, well, I, I also look forward to working with all of you to increase in-person testing op options, especially the very uh, popular and effective mobile sites throughout CB4. Um, the themes that, that we're really focusing on once we get past uh, the worst in the pandemic in the office uh, is public health. Uh, secondly, dealing with the climate justice um, and building in uh, resiliency for, for the climate change, which is already here. And, um, and third, equity, uh, which touches every sector of life here from uh, education to housing to employment to health to criminal justice. I know that, that there are many pressing issues in CB4 that I look forward to diving in and working with you on. This is a major, really national transportation hub. I see Christine here, who's been really a prominent citywide leader on this. I know you're working on the redesign of Penn Station. I know you're working on the redesign of the Port Authority bus terminal and trying to re-envision streets more broadly throughout the community board to put people first. And I'm, I'm grateful for the ways that you've been leading on that and want to be a partner with you. I know that this community is uh, impacted by the homeless crisis, perhaps as seriously as any other part of the city, um, and that all of us need to act um, to alleviate this horrible crisis of human suffering, to help get New Yorkers experiencing homelessness into shelter, into permanent housing. Um, I know you share that goal, and I know you understand that requires a multi-front approach because this is a mental health crisis, a substance abuse crisis, a housing crisis, um, a crisis of problems in our shelter system. Um, there's more to this than I can cover in a brief introductory remarks, but uh, I, I look forward to diving in and partnering with all of you on that issue, that issue and many, many other on behalf of our borough. Here on the Zoom tonight is someone I can introduce to you, Trisha Shimamura, who is going to be on our executive team as uh, our director of community affairs. Um, so she's, she's filling in tonight uh, as, as uh, our, our person here at CB4, but you will be hearing from her and getting to know her. She is phenomenal. Um, most recently uh, worked in community affairs at Columbia University. So I've had a chance to partner with her uptown um, and, and, and you're, you're gonna love working with her as well. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna pause there. Uh, Mr. Chair, I appreciate your time. I am so excited to work with all of you in, in the months and years ahead. 
uh, on, on behalf of this community that we love so much. Thank you. Absolutely, and we are as well. And Mr. Levine, if you would you take a couple of questions since we have- I would be here? happy to. Happy Great. To. Um, Mike, we'll start with you, please. Okay, well, it, it's great to see you. I'm so pleased that you're with us. Uh, Thanks, just to give you a, a, a little heads up on the uh, at-home testing uh, program that you just mentioned, I was alerted to it yesterday by one of our members, by the way, and I immediately tried to get an, uh, uh, an appointment. And it's done on a daily basis, so it starts at 8 a.m. This morning, uh, I, I try step, I think it was about 8.15 or something. By that point in time, every appointment had already been taken for the day. So uh, they're going to need a lot more people to make yeah, it. Yes, Mike, um, thank you for raising this. Um, uh, if my office can be of assistance to you uh, in securing your appointment, you'll, you'll let us know. Reach out to us, please. Um, but I, I, I may have been a little uh, unclear in what I was mentioning before. I was talking about a program by which you can have a self-test mailed to your home or a packet of self-tests. Uh, and in Britain, they'll mail you eight per week uh, for free. Um, and Colorado has a similar program. Um, and the idea is that this can keep you with the supply. Now, these are self-tests, so it's a little bit different. What you're talking about is a clinician comes to your home and performs a PCR test. So that exactly. is a higher, that's a higher caliber test. That is very important, uh, and they are overwhelmed right now. Uh, I'm not excusing it. They need more staff for the program. But yeah, uh, and, and, the, and the reason why the PCR is so important, my son came down with this uh, a week ago, and the at-home test, the rapid tests didn't show up any, uh, any, nothing. It was negative. The following morning, he went and had a PCR, and sure enough, he's, he had it. He has it. It's gone. Right. Right. I did not contract it from him, but just luckily, yeah. Um, I might have and not not known it, and that's why I'm asking for the PCR. So I'm just okay. giving you a heads up, you know. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Mike. And, and most importantly, I hope that you and your family uh, remain healthy and safe during this difficult time. Great. We're here to support you any way we can. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, Christopher. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, Jeffrey, congratulations on your first meeting. Uh, and you. congratulations, Bill President Levine. It's hey, great Chris. that and see you. Um, Thank you. To, uh, to tack on to testing, um, one, Colorado has got an exceptional program, as does Minnesota. Our neighboring state, New Jersey, has a program that's being slowly uh, rolled out with a company called Vault. Vault has had partnerships with five states right now. Um, and they were able to do testing in Minnesota as of January 2nd, I believe, in minus four degree weather. Uh, and the residents of Minnesota did not have to step outside into the cold. Yeah. We here in New York uh, suffer from extreme shifts in weather. And I was wondering, when is New York going to adopt an, uh, an in-building system, uh, hopefully for pediatrics and parents? Um, we have a number of schools here in the district. And I'm sure parents are getting fed up with having to stand online or look for home rapid tests. So is there going to be an emphasis on pediatric COVID testing care uh, within the next month or two? So the governor has announced that they have um, secured orders for uh, something around 35 million rapid tests. They, the first 1.6 million rapid tests, these are the rapid home self antigen tests. They, the first 1.6 million they distributed to uh, the city's Department of Ed to use um, for uh, families who have uh, a positive, if there's a positive uh, case in a classroom, families then get a package of self-tests and they, the child can test daily and as long as they're negative, they can come in to, to school. That's called a, a test to stay program. Um, but again, that was just the first shipment of what ultimately will be over 30 million for the state. Unfortunately, it's not all been delivered yet. And it seems like the timing is that it's going to be spread out over several weeks. Now they have not committed to the kind of program that, that, that I mentioned and that you were describing, which uh, would, would, would mail them to people's homes. There's a lot of advantages to a mail system because it, it avoids people having to show up somewhere 
and um, people, even people who are homebound can access them. Uh, so I've been advocating for that. I, I don't know there's been a commitment from the city or state, but believe me, uh, I'm fighting for that. And I appreciate you, Chris, uh, adding your voice uh, to the importance of that for families, for people of all ages uh, it, it, during this difficult stage of the pandemic. Yeah, and, and to the last question, pediatric uh, testing that's indoors, not exposed to the elements, is there going to be a pilot program built out for that? Ah, so you mean the, the in-person sites, not the... Um, that's correct. Yes, yes, yes. So that was like a two-point question. One yeah, was, right. hey, these states are activating, and two, these states are also activating in extreme cold to ensure that families are exposed to winter weather. This is a um, this is a challenge. I, I think not just for kids, Chris, but I think seniors too, and people who are vulnerable. Uh, we have a tough couple of winter months ahead. We actually opened a testing site at my northern Manhattan office uh, on 125th Street uh, today, and uh, which, if some of you want to come up, it's open uh, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day, uh, Monday through Friday. We have heated tents, but for the line, it's tough. Um, I will talk to the health department on this point, Chris, about having more indoor settings. Uh, one of the challenges is that the easiest thing to deploy are these mobile vans, which are very good because you can go to the places that are underserved very quickly. And other than the we weather issue, they've been pretty popular. But I'll talk to the health department about a plan to deal with the cold weather for kids, for seniors, and for everybody. Yeah, we have a lot of empty storefronts in Ninth Avenue, so tons of availability. Thanks, Thanks, Chris. Chris. Uh, Dolores next, and then Hector, Hector you're the final uh, hand for the borough president this evening. Dolores? So recognizing that uh, the congressman is also on, on air, um, I'm not going to actually ask for an answer, uh, but welcome to the job, Mark. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Dolores. Uh, but what I did want to, and I was very pleased that you at least are aware of some of the issues that we have suffered during the pandemic up in this uh, up neck of the woods. Um, what, some of the work that Gail was doing was about getting the uh, Midtown community court reopened. And if that's not on your radar, it is extremely important to focus on that as uh, the issues that you raised about the, what, uh, the problems that we were seeing related to homelessness uh, really can uh, be alleviated by having that partner in Midtown court open uh, to get at root causes and to try to uh, get folks uh, the help they need so that we do not see repeat offenders and we have good partnership with, um, with our police departments uh, to alleviate some of the ancillary problems to those core issues. So no answer needed now. I just wanted to make sure it's on your thank, radar. Thank, thank, thank you, Dolores. It is absolutely on my radar. Uh, the, the Midtown Community Court is a national model. Uh, it needs to be open as soon as possible. Um, Gail was very active on that. One of the many amazing things that she was working on, which I'm going to uh, continue, uh, but I appreciate you raising that. Thank you. And uh, if Congressman Nadler's on, that's great. I'll try and wrap up quick. Uh, he is uh, um, fighting for us very hard and uh, grateful for his leadership and service. So uh, I'll try and answer uh, uh, Hector's question quickly and, and then you can move on. So sure, Hector, thanks, Hector, go ahead. Uh, I just want to say congratulations to uh, Mark and uh, Eric and uh, all our new community board board members who are in new positions. Thanks a lot. Happy New Year. Um, okay, basically, uh, FYI, I tested positive for my daughter uh, about over 10, uh, almost 10 days ago. I'm in quarantine right now. One of the biggest issues that we've been having is a lot of misinformation once you test positive. Uh, some people say five days, some people say 10 days. Um, the lack of clarification and, and quality information being put out there, there's a lot of misinformation and confusion. So um, I really strongly suggest that somebody step up and try to get a little bit more solid information when somebody does test positive, because honestly, it's a detriment to the public. Uh, if somebody leaves quarantine too early, uh, some people are under the assumption after five days they're good to go and they, you know, they go about their business and, and spread the COVID even more. So uh, it, it's, it's a really serious concern. Uh, thankfully, I'm near the end of my quarantine with my daughter and we'll be out and about, but we'll take precautions, but not everybody will. So uh, a little bit more guidance will be very really helpful. Absolutely, Hector. And just very quickly, uh, first, uh, I, I hope you're feeling well and your daughter's doing well and I, I wish you uh, full, full and speedy recovery. 
you know, the CDC has been a little wobbly on this uh, in the last week or two. Unfortunately, uh, I think that the broader consensus in the public health community is that beginning at day five, if you've got, if you're five days since onset of symptoms, uh, if you are symptom free and you get a negative test that um, you can leave isolation, though you're gonna have to be very diligent about mask wearing until you get to day 10. Um, and if you're still testing negative, then you're gonna have to, to, to stick it out uh, until you get a full 10 days. Um, you know, one of the challenges is that is access to testing. And if we had more home testing, it could be easier. Um, but if you have access to testing, uh, I think the consensus in the community, again, is fully isolate for five days. And at that point, if you are symptom free and you get a negative test, you can exit isolation, but you still got to wear a very good mask. So I hope that's a little bit of clarity. And most importantly, I hope that you and your daughter do better and return to full health. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, just a little... Um clarification on the testing. Uh, we've been notified and research has shown that unfortunately uh, it takes about 90 days for the COVID not to show up in your system apparently. So you will get false positive even though you do testing again within, you know, after quarantine. So yes, yeah, so and this, this gets down to too many details, but uh, the, the, the PCR tests, which are the more robust tests, which are uh, processed in a lab, do tend to, to remain positive for a long time. But the antigen tests, which are the quickies that you do at home in 15 minutes, tend to um, really start to show negative after the period of contagiousness. Um, so that's a decent, uh, even though it's uh, a less robust method, it is a decent way to see whether you're contagious. So if you have access to the home health test, which I know are not easy to get, which is what I was talking about previously, then start using them on day five. And health experts are saying, if you get a negative on an antigen, uh, then you can you can leave isolation. So I'll leave that there. Thank you, Hector. Thank you, and Mr. Vera President. Thank you, um, Perry and Tina, I do want to continue on with your the evening. I see your hands. I think I feel pretty confident saying that Mark will be with us again. <laughs> I um, will. And so we thank you for being well, here tonight. What, what I'll say, I don't know if it was Harry and Tina, if they'd like to put their comments in the chat or a question in the chat. Uh, Trisha and I will stick around for a couple minutes, and if it's an issue we can address in the chat or follow up directly with them, we're happy to. Sorry, I know I'm out of order, but can I make a quick clarification? Because I also have a child who has COVID that children cannot go back to school for 10 days, not five days. So I just want to put that out there. Yes, if they test positive. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, you are correct. Thanks, Carrie. All right, Mr. Borough President, we will see you again, and thank you for being here tonight. <clears throat> Bye, folks. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, to Washington, our esteemed Congressman, uh, Mr. Jerry Nadler, thank you for being here tonight. Well, thank you very much. And if uh, Mark is still on the, uh, is still on the uh, uh, Zoom, uh, congratulations for your assumption of office. And so let me start by wishing everybody a happy new year. Unfortunately, we're starting off the year dealing with a new spike in COVID-19 cases with the Omicron variant, with New York being hit especially hard. I want to first encourage everyone to get vaccinated and boosted if you've not already done so to protect yourself and your loved ones. As the pandemic continues to pose difficult challenges in our daily lives, I'm pushing Congress to extend and expand pandemic related federal assistance programs. Last month, along with Congresswoman Maloney, I introduced the Low Revenue Paycheck Protection Program Relief Act. The Paycheck Protection Program, or the PPP, gave small businesses 24 weeks after receipt of their loan to spend the money on forgivable expenses, which didn't help businesses that had to stay closed for much longer, like many of those in our neighborhoods. This bill would allow PPP recipients to shift the, the covered period of the loan to gain loan forgiveness if the small business was not in operation between April 1st, 2020 and December 31st, 2020, or if it saw a revenue reduction during that period of at least 80% from 2019. The point of PPP was to provide forgivable loans to small businesses to save jobs and livelihoods. This fix will strengthen PPP's equity and ensure more of our hardest hit small businesses are eligible for loan forgiveness. In November, the president signed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act into law. 
also known as the bipartisan infrastructure deal, it contains a major investment in our physical infrastructure. That translates into a lot of money for New York. New York will receive $11.6 billion for federal highway, federal aid highway apportioned programs and $1.9 billion for bridge replacement and repairs, $10.5 billion for the MTA, and $3.6 billion to prepare New York infrastructure for the impacts of climate change, cyber attacks, and extreme weather events. Bus rapid transit and bus lanes are now eligible for capital funding from the federal government, and we greatly appreciate the ability for states and localities to apply for funding for pedestrian and bike infrastructure. Plus, billions more spread out across various programs on transit accessibility for seniors and the disabled, broadband, electric vehicle charging, grid reliability, water systems, and others. The House also passed the Build Back Better Act, the reconciliation bill, which is at the core of the president's agenda. And I continue to encourage my Senate colleagues to pass this bill quickly, although, as I'm sure you know, there's a real struggle in the Senate going on about this. This bold progressive bill will have a positive impact on every single American family. Here is some of what the bill does for New Yorkers. The bill includes the largest investment to combat the climate crisis in human history, more than $550 billion to cut pollution, reduce energy costs, and create good paying jobs. Build Back Better will protect New York City in the face of worsening climate related disasters by including historic investments in coastal restoration and protection, and investing in actions that address environmental and climate justice. The Build Back Better Act also delivers once in a generation investment to lower the everyday costs that burden working families, from healthcare to childcare and more, fully paid for by making big corporations and the wealthiest pay their fair share. The bill lowers healthcare costs by negotiating lower drug prices for seniors, halting big pharma's outrageous price hikes above inflation, and expanding the Affordable Care Act to make coverage more affordable for those who buy insurance on their own. It lowers the cost of childcare and family care by expanding the basic promise of free schooling in America for the first time in 100 years with universal preschool for all three and four year olds, slashing families' childcare costs, extending the landmark Biden child tax credit and expanding access to affordable home care for older adults and those with disabilities. The legislation also cuts taxes and reduces the most burdensome expenses for New York families by establishing paid family and medical leave, passing the largest expansion of the Affordable Care Act in a decade, slashing the cost of prescription drugs, expanding rental assistance and affordable housing, including billions for NYCHA, and finally addressing the unfair assault deduction caps instituted by the Republicans' 2017 tax changes. Additionally, the Build Back Better Act strengthens and extends tax credits to working families by providing up to $1,500 in tax cuts for 983,000 low-age workers in New York by extending the American Rescue Plan's earned income tax credit expansion and the Biden child tax credit for 35 million families. I'll stop there, but the Build Back Better Act has a lot more in there that we'll be talking about in the coming weeks. And I certainly hope the Senate uh, gets over its... Um, 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 it, it's it's uh, hesitations and passes the bill. The Judiciary Committee, the House Judiciary Committee, which I chair, has also been quite active since I last spoke uh, to CB4. We've passed bills to protect voting rights, a suite of bills to lower prescription drug costs and increase access to hard to find drugs to changes to patent laws, to reform our immigration system to at least make some sense, combat hate crimes, and much more. In the House, we passed the Women's Health Protection Act, and we continue to fight abortion rights to protect abortion rights across the country, particularly in light of the attacks from Texas and the legal threat to abortion access currently before the Supreme Court. I'm going to leave it there for now, but I'm happy to take uh, questions. Congressman, thank you. We know you've been busy. busy. Any questions for the Congressman? I actually have one, if you don't mind. Today, um, sure. the governor mentioned in her State of the State uh, one of your favorite projects, the Cross Harbor Tunnel. Um, yes, and so, you know, freight, um, you know, vehicle, truck traffic is a major factor in our district. Where would, how would this benefit uh, the West Side in terms of freight? Well, it would benefit the, the entire region more than specifically the West Side. Um, right now, New York is the only major city in North America 
which never built a, uh, a tunnel or a bridge that can handle freight traffic, major freight traffic uh, across its river or harbor. Um, and this in increases pollution, increases, uh, gives us the highest asthma rates in the world, especially in the South Bronx, where everything that crosses the Hudson River comes over the George Washington Bridge and goes to the North Bronx Expressway. Um, uh, increases carbon emissions um, and, and, and so forth. And, and of course, wear and tear on the roads from all these uh, 18 wheelers is incredible and increases our infrastructure costs. So the, the freight harbor tunnel, which I've been pushing for many years, um, got a great boost today by the, by the governor who included it in her state of the state address as a necessary project. And this is, it would, it would take advantage of an existing uh, uh, basically unused rail line that goes from the, uh, from the, from Northern Queens curving through Brooklyn to Bayonne, I'm sorry, to Bay Ridge, <laughs> would build a tunnel from Bay Ridge to Bayonne to connect with existing rail lines there. And uh, this would be used uh, for a long time, they didn't think it was compatible, but we know it is now compatible for both freight and passengers. So it would greatly increase um, um, the flexibility, the passenger rail system in, in New York City, and to do all of everything I said about the, about the freight system. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions for the Congressman? Um, Leslie, go ahead, sorry. Congressman, welcome. Good evening to see, happy to see you. I have a quick question. What are your thoughts on the Supreme Court in increasing numbers? Because it well, impacts so much across the country and New York. Well, Senator Ed Markey and I several months ago in, uh, introduced legislation to increase the size of the court by four. Um, the, the size of the Supreme Court, although many people think it's written in stone or in the constitution is not. It's been changed seven times in American history, um, not recently. The last time the attempt was made to change it was by uh, FDR in the 30s because the Supreme Court was killing all the New Deal legislation. And um, um, FDR proposed expanding the court and uh, Chief Justice Hughes, uh, Charles Evans Hughes, uh, in what is known colloquially as the switch in time that saved nine, switched his vote and started upholding all the New Deal legislation. And um, um, that was the last time we're seriously considered. But given the Supreme Court now, how, do, how it has been packed by Trump and by McConnell um, uh, and, and the threats it's posing uh, to, to everything, to abortion rights, to, to, to voting rights, et cetera, um, it's time, I think it's time to give very serious consideration to expanding the size of the court. And that's why Ed and I introduced the legislation several months ago. Thank you. Thank you for that, Leslie. Um, Mike, we have a couple of other elected officials up tonight. Is your question um, a brief one? Oh, it's just a thank you. I, I thank uh, Congressman Nadler again for a great constitutional and Supreme Court lesson uh, that uh, you know he's done once again. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for that, Mike. Um, well, Congressman, um, we appreciate you being here tonight and of course, all your good work in Washington on our behalf. So keep that up. Will do. Thank you. Good to see you. You too. Alrighty, uh, moving to Albany. I believe, let's see. Um, I'd like to pause a moment and, and start with um, our assembly member, Dick Gottfried, um, who he's a former, I. I Full transparency, I was a former staffer for the assembly member. Um, and there was some big news recently um, about the assembly member. So I wanna pass it over to Dick um, for updates from him tonight as well. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. And yeah, I guess the news you're probably referring to is uh, about a month ago, I announced that I am retiring from the legislature. I will not run for reelection this coming year uh, and when my term ends at the end of this year, I will uh, become a private citizen. Um, and I don't want to reminisce at this point because we've only got a few hours. Uh, we'll save instead, that for December. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but instead, what I do want to do is thank Community Board 4. 
because uh, I and all the other local elected officials representing Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen could not do our jobs uh, without, without Board 4. Uh, Board 4's leadership on, on, on local issues, uh, we all rely heavily on Board 4 and its members for the, the 52 years that I've uh, represented uh, Hell's Kitchen and, uh, and part of now just about all of Chelsea uh, in the assembly, uh, Board 4 has been chock full of people who are smart, knowledgeable, thoughtful, hardworking, persistent, progressive, care about the community. And it's just been magnificent uh, to be able to, not only to work with, but to rely on Community Board 4. So thank you for all of that. Uh, I also wanna congratulate uh, Jeffrey on uh, becoming the, uh, the new uh, chair of the board. Uh, I think you're gonna do a terrific job. Uh, and if, if, if I played uh, any small part in, uh, in, in shaping what the, you know, the, the work that you've been doing, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted uh, if I can take a little credit for that. Uh, I also wanna congratulate uh, our new council member, Eric Botcher, uh, who I'm really looking forward to working with uh, and, and our borough president, Mark Levine, uh, I mean, we all saw this evening what a what a terrific uh, public official uh, he is and what a great borough president he's going to be. Um, for the very northern part of Board 4, of course, we also have, in a sense, a new council member uh, in Gail Brewer, uh, who is, uh, I guess, a, a, about as addicted to public service as I've been. Uh, and <laughs> Having gone from the council to borough president, term limited out of borough president, uh, she has uh, come back as, as our council member. Um, to report on just a couple of uh, issues, um, I, I'm, I know board four has been very concerned about uh, extending the provisions of the state open meetings law uh, that has enabled uh, community boards uh, and, and other public bodies uh, to meet remotely uh, we do need to renew that legislation. Uh, and uh, in my view, it should not depend on, on a declaration of emergency by the governor. Um, and I am hopeful that, uh, that in short order, um, the legislature will, uh, will extend the provisions in the open meetings law uh, to accommodate uh, remote meetings by community boards and other public bodies. We really need to do that. Uh, Governor Hochul recently signed a bill of mine uh, to provide that when any uh, hospital uh, is proposing, is seeking state permission uh, to reduce services or to move services from, uh, from one facility to another uh, or, or to eliminate uh, a service in the building, uh, that in, in addition to all the other information that they would have to provide uh, to the health department and the public health and health planning council, they would also have to do sort of a health equity equivalent of an environmental impact statement. They will now be required to do what we're calling a health equity uh, assessment. Uh, and the health department and the public health and health planning council will have to consider uh, those health impacts uh, in, uh, in whatever they decide. It doesn't guarantee health equity, but at least it guarantees that there will be an open and and and, and informed discussion uh, of, of the impact, uh, particularly on underserved populations, uh, when our hospitals uh, move services, particularly from a from a small community hospital uh, far away to a to a big academic medical center, and we've of course had some experience on that. Uh, here in, in Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about is uh, the governor gave her first state of the state speech uh, today. Uh, some of you, um, I, I imagine, listened to it uh, uh, on the radio or on TV or online. Uh, I'm sure you, if you go to the governor's website, uh, I'm sure a recording of it is available. Uh, it would take you about, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes to listen to. I highly recommend it. There's also a lot of information about what she said, 
on the governor's uh, website. Uh, this was the 52nd time I've listened to a governor's uh, state of the state message as an assembly member. Uh, governor Hochul is, my, is the ninth governor I have served with. Uh, and I would say that this is undoubtedly the best state of the state message from my viewpoint uh, that I've heard of, of, of all the 52. Uh, and I really applaud her. She spoke out forcefully and progressively on a, on an, on a breathtaking uh, range of issues. As health chair in the assembly, I was most interested in what she had to say about strengthening our healthcare system, uh, particularly the Medicaid program. Uh, you know, governors have loved to kick around uh, the Medicaid program and, and, and treat the money we spend on Medicaid as, uh, as some kind of a burden uh, rather than an opportunity to really help uh, the 40% the of New Yorkers who depend on Medicaid for their health care. Uh, in this state of the state message, uh, Governor Hochul clearly regards Medicaid as, as an investment, not a burden. Uh, and has made a variety of proposals uh, to improve and strengthen our Medicaid program and other uh, public health coverage programs rather than uh, looking to trash them. Uh, so I'm looking forward to a, uh, a very productive legislative session uh, with the governor. Uh, this year, she signed 24 of my bills into law, uh, which is some kind of record, certainly for me. Um, so I've, I've worked well with her. I'm looking forward to working well with her. That's it for, for me. I, I'd be happy to take questions. Excellent. Thank you for that, Dick. Uh, Leslie. Or no question? You're just, you're on mute. You're good? Okay. Um, anybody with questions for the assembly member? Okay. Thanks for being here, Dick, and good luck in session. Okay, you've, you've, you've got me for another 12 months and uh, you'll be seeing a lot of me. Sounds good, thank you. <clears throat> All right, to our other representative in the assembly, assembly member Linda Rosenthal is with us this evening. Whoops, I just lost all of you. There you are, hi Linda. There I am, just fresh off the train from Albany and um, I couldn't miss Jeffrey's first meeting presiding <laughs> as chair, so thank I you. rushed. I rushed home to see you. And um, I'm delighted to see Trisha uh, landed with uh, Mark Levine. And I think that's great for all of us. And I'm also delighted that um, Mark Levine is uh, springing into action on day one, which we need seriously in, um, in this city where Omicron seems to be taking its toll. You know, Dick says it's his 52nd state of the state, but I bet it's his first watching it from his office because we were not allowed on the floor. And some of you may recall uh, Governor Cuomo had had re, you know, said we're, we're not going to do it in the chamber anymore because that was a tradition of many, many decades. So he did it elsewhere. Governor Hochul said, I'm going to come back to the assembly chamber and do it. Sadly, it would have been better in the convention center this year because you know, because of uh, COVID. And, um, but I, I agree, it was uh, quite a good speech. Um, as a former staffer for Jerry Nadler, I was delighted to hear about the Cross Harbor Rail. I'm like, wait a minute. I haven't heard those words in a long time, but I was happy for him and I'm happy for all of us. Um, I was also happy to hear um, some of the things that the governor spoke about are actually initiatives that I've been pursuing and I'm just happy to have an ally um, in that. For example, 421A, done. It, it does expire this year um, and it's unclear if, there will be another program to replace it to create more affordable housing. That we have has yet to be revealed, but at least she acknowledged that this one was uh, was no good. Um, we also we she did talk about gun violence, and I have a bill with Brad Hoyleman. Uh, she signed our ghost gun bill last year. I think we talked about that. And we have a bill on micro stamping that uh, right now, if there's no micro stamping on, um, on a bullet, it's hard to trace the gun 
you know, where the bullet came from. And this would require micro stamping. So I'm glad she mentioned that. Um, she talked a lot about SUNY and TAP for people who were formerly incarcerated and for part-time students giving them TAP. So, you know, I like her, I like her vision um, on that. And she also talked a lot about mental health uh, problems and that, uh, you know, I have a bill with Senator Samra Brook from Rochester about licensing school psychologists so they can actually practice outside the school building, which is something they've done for the past two years because no one's in the school building or She fell through the screen. Linda, you're <laughs> back. <laughs> Are you there? Right. Yes. Sorry. Okay. That's yeah. okay. Okay. Um, so um, that was good. You know, we had a huge demonstration outside the Capitol because no one's allowed in because of COVID. So there were hundreds and hundreds of uh, anti-vaxxers out there. I'm glad they weren't let in because I don't need to be exposed. However, our speaker, who we all met with yesterday, Carl Hasty, tested positive. So. I am hopeful that I won't catch it from him because uh, we were all milling about. So having said that, please everyone stay safe. And I have masks. I have those N95 in my office. So um, I'm gonna be giving them out. And if anybody wants a bunch to give out to their building or whatever, um, email me and we'll get it to you. And um, let's see what else. Um, Gail and I wrote to the city to get a pop-up um, testing site. So we're gonna have one on Saturday and Sunday at 64th Street between Amsterdam and uh, West End uh, near the NYCHA development. And Eric Botcher and I are trying to get one for DeWitt Clinton Park in the part that we share. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, also having a Mamo van, which was oversubscribed last time. So we're having one in February. So we'll send that notice out. And um, I know I'm a special guest this month because it really wasn't my month. So I will conclude there, but it's great to see all of you. I'm happy to be going back to Albany, doing the people's work up there and look forward to working all together with all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. We appreciate it. Thank you for being okay. here tonight. And um, to a successful session to you as well. <clears throat> um, our final guest for the evening, um, she's a familiar face here with a new title. Um, our longtime friend and now council member, the Honorable Gail Brewer is with us this evening. Hi, Gail. Hi, Jeffrey, and thank you very much and congratulations. And I just have a few blocks of board four, but I do love board four. So there are a few things. First of all, it's quite a day at the city council because of the new speaker, first black woman, lots of clapping and excitement. And um, afterwards, the many of the members went out drinking and eating. So it's a much more fun than the group that I am familiar with. So it's very nice. I'm definitely the senior states person. And it's very interesting, never been that before. And Gail, but didn't I, you have the pleasure of nominating the speaker? I did. I nominated the speaker. I'm on the rules committee and somebody tweeted out, not me, that I'm going to be the chair of oversight. So we'll ah. see. It's a very, it's a very good um, group of people to be working with and, you know, exciting. I don't get excited too, too much, but this group is very exciting. A couple of things. First of all, just in terms of money, because the city council does allocate and I sure want folks to know, even though Eric Botcher does a great job, but there are a few blocks that are in my district. Obviously the expense budget is due February 22nd. The capital budget is due March 24th. And we are doing participatory budgeting. We can put it, send, uh, I think Jesse Bodine has the information, but we have a newsletter. If you sign up, you'll get all the information. That is due January uh, 23rd. So it's very quick in terms of these deadlines in order to get information in. I do wanna say a couple of, um, substantive things, it's not exactly in my area, but this Midtown court, I believe is still closed. It's, you know, they're doing services, but the court itself has got to get it open. As borough president, I sent a letter requesting that it open. Um, Alvin Bragg wrote a long letter about some of his concerns and what he wants to work on, but one of them in terms of folks who are not in need of going to Rikers is 
um, what are they going to do? I always felt that whether it's young persons or persons with low level crimes, that court is a wonderful location. It's a state issue, it's not a city issue, but it's certainly we need to advocate for. Second, I know that congestion pricing will come up. Um, it will hopefully include a member of your uh, wonderful esteemed board to be on it. Um, and um, I just want to say that we have to pay a lot of attention to make sure that happens because I think we know that when it does happen, every single person who owns a car south of 60th Street is going to call me, you, and everybody else. So we've got to have a voice on that congestion pricing. So I think we need to do even more advocacy. I also want to um, mention that um, the schools, I think perhaps have hit the hardest, been hit the hardest in terms of the pandemic. Um, I talked to 15 principals yesterday, maybe 20 principals. And in some cases, because to the credit of the administration, there's a lot of testing going on. In one case, 115 students were sent home that day because of COVID. So there has to be um, a lot of attention paid to the schools in terms of their future, in terms of making sure they have the social workers, they have the after school programs, et cetera, and not everybody does. I wanna just um, conclude by stating, even though it's not in your district, we have a district office that's on 87th and Broadway, and we have the uh, phone number, which is 212-873-0282. And we, I have ironically the same G Brewer at council.nyc.gov, and you can always reach me. I think the final uh, piece will be, I'm very focused on land use. And I assume at one point in Harborview, somebody will say that there is a project to build there and it has to be 100% affordable housing. Um, that project has been coming up since I was in the council before. So thank you, Dick Godfrey, for reminding us about years and decades. And thank you for your kind comments, assembly member. But I do want to say that um, we have to pay attention to that project as the uh, it was promised to be 100% affordable. And there have been some uh, discussions about doing otherwise. And I think those of us who have long memories want to be clear that it has to be 100% and it needs to happen the way that we expect it to happen. Um, stay safe. I don't, I think there are, there, you know, there are many members of the city council who had COVID. Um, and so we're all being, even today, there was a lot of hugging and kissing. So I hope um, that it goes well for everybody and for you. Um, composting is something that I feel strongly about. I know that board seven, I believe, has got one of the two boards in Manhattan where they are doing it because another, a lot of people signed up. So I think board four should do the same and uh, try to sign up and do as much composting as possible. The city really sends out emails and does a great job if in fact you're signed up. So it's not hard to do and I urge everybody to sign up. Happy new year and thank you very much. Thank you, council member. Will you, do you have a moment for a question, Gail? If sure. Perfect, um, Dolores. And of course, I don't want to steal your thunder, but Dolores made sure that the Newborough president is fully aware of your advocacy on the Midtown Community Court. So um, she didn't waste any time. Dolores, over to you. It, it's not even a question. Well, it's not really a question. It's more, uh, Gail, can you clarify exactly what uh, blocks you have and if Harborview is uh, part of uh, your uh, council district? Yeah, it's 10th Avenue, 54th to 59th, so it's pretty much west. Um, and, you know, I think it, it might even be sort of split, you know, the way that, uh, who knows, but it's definitely 10th Avenue, 54th to 59th Street going west. Thank you. Thanks, Dolores. Um, that Gail, thank you for being here. Thank you. Good luck, in the, good luck in the city council. Thank you. All right, um, that concludes our reports from elected officials this evening. And so moving on to the business portion of the meeting, um, we're gonna start uh, with BLP, business license and permits. Bert, I see you here, are you leading on this? Is Frank here as well? I'm on this. Okay. New chair, congratulations. Oh, Frank is here, sorry. And happy new year to everybody. We'll do this relatively, what? For just a quick reminder, just as a note to everybody, remember we'll be taking our votes at the end. So obviously we'll pull out questions, but no voting individually on the items. Okay. Sorry, Bert, go ahead. Yep. Um, we have items one through 10 from the Business License and Permits Committee. Uh, on a vote, if we were voting right at this moment, I would bundle all of them. Um, I do want to point out that on item 10, which is the cheese boat on um, 
747 Ninth Avenue, there was one typo. Uh, it says the hours of operation are um, 11 to 12 midnight, seven days a week. That was a typo. It's 11 to 12 um, Monday, I mean, excuse me, Sunday through Wednesday. Thursday through Saturday, it's 11 to 2. So it's midnight, four nights a week, 2 a.m., three nights a week. That was a typo. We knew it, but some, for some reason, it wasn't incorporated. Um, uh, if there's any questions, that's it. But I, and if there's no questions, I do want to just throw out a couple of things for the future. Sure, any, any questions on the BLP letters? Okay, you had something else, Bert? Yeah, I just want pe people to be aware that in this new year, we have a bunch of items. Everybody's making reference to the governor's uh, state of the state address. Well, one thing in the governor's state of the state address was her uh, backing of what we had temporarily a year ago, what we call, I don't know what the, drinks to go up to the bar, at the door, at the window, wherever it was, order your gin and tonic, order your martini, and then walk away. That was temporarily. In the governor's state of the state, she likes to make it permanent. So this is gonna be discussed by BLP. We're gonna have something to come before the full board on that. I also want people to be aware that Recently, temporary liquor licenses, okay? Up to now, people applied for a liquor license in New York City, and it was permanent. It was a whole process. Now they can also apply simultaneously for a temporary liquor license. This is done upstate. It's been done upstate for years. It's never before been done in New York City. We have no idea how this operates. We have no idea how it's going to function. We have no idea what BLP and Community Board 4 will be in the process. So we got to find that out. People need to be aware. Two more, th two more things that people should be aware of, probably know. Permanent street dining. Everybody's trying to work out what are going to be the rules and regs and who's going to be in charge of the process. Okay, that's going to be done this year. And cannabis. January 1st, it became legal in New York State, okay? But no one knows what that means. It was only recently, at the end of in December, was a board appointed to study licensing. Licensing of both retail and licensing of what it's called, if you travel around the country, cannabis lounges, which is the equivalent to a liquor in place, a bar, but you go in and you sit around and you smoke. So, pot, whatever, whatever generation you are, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Um, are we going to be involved? Community Board 4 be involved? ELP be involved? We have no idea. So, I, I don't want people to be surprised about any of this. This is all now coming up. But the most immediate thing is. The temporary licensing, we're going to have to look and see what that means. And the drinks to go. We're going to definitely be talking about it at the drinks to go on our agenda next week. So, Thank you, Bert. OK, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Moving on. Um, waterfront Parks and Environment. Marty? So uh, the board's gain is our loss, Jeffrey. Congrat congratulations. Uh, we, we lose you as co-chair, but then we benefit with Leslie. Um, and so uh, congratulations. Uh, th this letter uh, speaks pretty well for itself. Uh, when it first came to us, I, w I w and the committee was concerned that there would be a unique use of squash courts to the exclusion of others. We asked those questions. Parks regularly reviews uh, the use of its facilities. Uh, it did not recommend uh, this. It wanted our opinion. Uh, however, there are other squash courts in other places that uh, Parks supervises, 
and parks also converts other um, facilities uses over time as, as they see appropriate. A question was asked of me about the diversity uh, of us rather, uh, of the diversity of people using it. Uh, the squash courts will be used uh, primarily, but not exclusively by Hudson Guild. And they have a, a diverse and actually relatively low income population. So I think that covers the questions that we were asked about this letter and uh, I'll answer questions if any. And then we did receive a couple of um, friendly amendments from Ms. McIntosh, who has her hand up now as well. So Betty, um, I, 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 put, I put her amendments in the letter. I am sorry, I didn't mention it. That's okay. Um, thank you, Marty. I, I had an information question of if you make, if you convert a um, handball court to a squash court, does that mean that, that if you're not, if squash people are not using the squash court, can handball people be using it for handball or is that ruled out? I did not get a chance to ask that question of parks. Uh, I don't know the answer to it. Uh, I, I presume, I, I, I'm, I'll make no presumption at all. Uh, another question that you, you asked was, uh, what about a summer survey? Uh, and uh, there was a survey done as the letter notes in, a, in the footnote, uh, but it would be interesting to know how these courts are used in the summer. And that's related to your question. If the <laughs> handball courts aren't, uh, well used, then your question is moot. If the handball courts are well used in the summer uh, and the squash courts are not well used, then your question becomes relevant. So we, we do need to continue asking the question that you just asked. Yeah, as I said in my note to you that I have some reluctance to support this letter because I think that the survey in cold weather doesn't really reveal the handball court usage and I walked by there frequently and it struck me that the handball courts were used very, very actively. So I, I would prefer if, if this could be delayed maybe and, and the survey in warm weather be taken. Mike? Uh, yeah, uh, just, just to get to the point of whether you can use the court for both squash and handball, you can, right? Yeah, you can. Yeah, the squash uses squash it's uses the lines that are painted. It, exactly, it's just a matter of the lines. You know, the squash. I used to. This is one of my things when I was a younger guy. I wish I could do it today, but it uh, just a matter of the walls. You see, in the lines. So yeah, it's don't worry about that, Betty. Okay. okay. Good. And uh, Betty, just so you know, and the rest of the folks know, a key factor was understanding like the time, amount of time that the guild would want to sort of have the court for its classes for squash. And um, that we, the committee took this up, this issue, we took this over two uh, meetings um, and there was a lot of discussion and deliberation around the timing as well, which we reflected in the letter. So uh, Hector. Yeah, um, I'm really glad Betty brought up the issue of the handball uh, usage. Um, yeah, I'm, by reading the letter, it seems, I mean, I understand that they can draw, you know, they can redraw the lines, uh, make it more compatible for squash or uh, some other sports, but it doesn't really state in here anywhere that it'll still be optional for handball to be used in the court as well. Uh, it just says that that's what it's being used for now. Hmm. And it almost seems like uh, once they convert it over, uh, it almost sounds like it won't be available for handball usage anymore. So that, that is a concern, you know, I think. That sounds, that, that sounds like a friendly amendment, Marty, right? That we could say the courts could continue to exist as um, handball when, you know, handball or squash, basically. Hmm. That, that would make it much more compatible. I'll, I'll be extremely happy to put the handball or squash in there. I, I was careful to include in the letter that the uh, scheduling of activities on these courts is, is going to be handled by, 
by parks with the exception of the period of time that the Hudson Guild folks will be using it, which is late afternoon. Jesse? <laughs> Um, I, and, and maybe it was clear in the letter, but man, I just want to make sure everybody, to my knowledge, right, Jeffrey, I mean, there and Marty, there are multiple handball courts at this location, and this would be taking, I believe, I'm actually not sure if it's one or two. There, no, there are, there, are, there are six handball courts at this location, three of which will become squash courts. Got it. Okay. Thank you. So it's not an elimination by any means. Right. Not an elimination. Thank Thanks, Jesse. Christine? So I'm catching on what you just said that the uh, scheduling for Hudson, by Hudson Guild will be only in the evening and some days a week, which means that the rest of the days are not being scheduled by Hudson Guild and therefore may not be as accessible to from an equitable standpoint. Um, I Sorry, I, I'm not sure I understood your question, Christine. What I'm saying is that if Parks is scheduling the activities during the day. That's right. They, they, they are, and, and Hudson Guild has only control over a part of the day. Is the equity aspect going to be the same during the Parks management versus the Hudson Guild management? You what mean if there's mean? like a squash league that wants to play on these courts? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. And they are coming from another part of the city. And so all the time where it's scheduled by park, you know, I, I wouldn't want all these courts to be dedicated to, you know, other players in the city. In terms of the discussion yeah. on this at the, at the committee, um, if there were tournaments or leagues that were utilizing it, that's when parks scheduling would kick in. That's right. um, Marty, that's how you understood it, right? Yes, it is. So that otherwise, means I mean, it's sort of a, it's also a first come first serve at the same time. If there's not something scheduled or happening, somebody can come and use it. So do we have any sense of how much percent of the time it's going to, because that, that those courts are now Hudson Guild controlled, right? No, those courts are now controlled by parks. There are six. I'm sorry, there are six courts there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. That are handball courts. Right. The, the idea is for Hudson Guild and its partner to build three squash courts uh, with parks approval, so that they're visible and not locked, uh, and that those courts will then be scheduled for Hudson Guild in the times indicated in the letter, and other times are to be done through parks. Got it, got it, sorry. I'm good. Christopher. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, no, Betty brings up some points that I would like to echo. One, that the survey done was during cold weather times during low usage, um, and it, it should have been done during peak months and peak hours of usage, um, and I, I would, really like to see this revisited after a proper survey for a warm weather sport location is done. The second is uh, I, I hold a tennis permit and in New York City, for the most part, you need to apply, um, one, you need to pay for a tennis permit every season, winter and warm weather. So those two, those are two permits. The second is you can, you can go into the parks website and request a tennis court anywhere in New York so long as you're a permit holder. Uh, and in some locations where there are tennis centers, like at Prospect Park and Central Park, you don't have to have a permit, but you have to pay an additional fee. This seems like the court, as it is done traditionally through parks, would no longer be accessible in the traditional fashion that handball courts are used and basketball courts are used, which is first come, first serve, pick up games. There's a casualness to it. And I'm fearing that this permitted request uh, will, eh, I don't know, I don't want to say gentrify uh, a space, uh, but certainly pull back access um, from uh, uh, traditional cultural ways that uh, the, these courts are used in New York City. Uh, uh, Chris, I, I think your concerns, uh, first of all, these are concerns that we talked about uh, 
during during the committee meeting and their and their um, important concerns. Uh, the reservation system was never well described to us, but it was clear that it would not be uh, the permitted system of that you're familiar with that you tried to describe about tennis. That's it's okay. not going to be so, the but, same. But, the, but a reservation system is citywide. Just to let you know. May I jump in? I'm sorry, Marty. As imagine Chris and you were there at the meeting. Um, I think one of the points I was there for the actually, early portion of it, not for the entirety. Oh, okay. What the, the the I think what the committee liked, and just to, so everyone else knows, was the uh, the reverse of gentrification. It was and Ken Jockers was there from Hudson Guild advocating for this. It was bringing a sport that might not be introduced in that area to those children or that you know um, population and to kind of bring them into the, bring people there into the fold this is a sport that you know m- might otherwise be unavailable um, i'm familiar with 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 no, no, but with, what, with the what i'm saying is so we but... like that we we just said that's it we just like that that okay. it was it was introducing a sport to you know something some uh, a population that might not be otherwise introduced to. And, and as a Latino that, raised in I, I think kitchen. that was a significant on, component of this. A, a, given as a Latino raised in Hell's Kitchen, I learned how to play tennis in public school. I'm very grateful for that opportunity. What I'm saying here is that the traditional use of public courts, like handball courts and basketball courts, is play on, play off, first come, first serve. They're pickup games. And so any fashion where there's a timetable controlled by parks takes away from that, like, long-standing generational tradition of being able to walk onto a court and just using it. If that's the model, if that's the model that we're going to see and what, what I think should be included in the letter uh, is are two things. Uh, I, would, I would include that we recommend a survey to be done during the summer, uh, not necessarily hold up the, the building of the handball courts until this summer, but at least be sure that such a survey is done in, in, in warm weather. Um, and uh, to get more clarity on uh, as Parks develops it, because it's all in the talking stage still, uh, as Parks develops the system of who uses the court when, what will be the mixture of what Chris is talking about, walk on and use and uh, pre- pre-reservations. And it's, it's, not, it's not been fully decided yet. And so we should ask Parks for uh, feedback as they develop it further. Dolores. Thank you. Uh, so Marty, you just summed up what I was going to suggest. We clearly have questions around clarity that we don't have. And I think the conversation that we're having right now um, is because we don't have answers. So if the letter is asking for that clarity, I think that we can continue to take it up um, in further months to ensure that we're getting exactly what we need for our specific community and for squash and handball community folks. Alan. Thank you. So my concern at the meeting was that not speaking about Hudson Gill, but that an organization, the youth group, uh, couldn't block out um, large, large portions of the uh, courts uh, which happened a couple of years ago, um, I think in, in, with the baseball fields or I think PS33 was looking to do a, a um, field day and they couldn't find a date because one of the organizations had blocked out the field for like the whole summer time. So I think Parks needs to be mindful of that in terms of how they, do, how they run their reservations. Thanks, Alan. Katie? Thanks, um, Marty. I really like what you said about uh, seeking more information, but not holding up this proposal right now, because um, this is clearly about giving access to students during the school year for this program. And the idea that we that we wouldn't help facilitate this program for these students this school year, because we want to see how it's used next summer. Um, uh, I think would, would be unfortunate. And I also think it's really important for us to understand that um, we certainly want to make sure that um, courts are available to people from all over the city, but this is a real opportunity for students who are attending a program in our district. And we've talked about wanting to make sure that there are lots of opportunities for students in our district. And so I, I do hope that we support this program and at the same time, get more information. 
Thanks. Thanks, Katie. Christine's gonna have the final comment on this letter. So Marty, I think you, you summarized very nicely. I would just like to see that instead of asking for information on the reservation, that we are more uh, specific about what we want. And, you know, and, and, and the points that Alan made that we don't want to have large blocks reserved and uh, we don't want to have people to pay and first, first come, first serve. So these are, there are aspects of uh, that that we like. And I think we should make it very clear that these are the way we would like to see them reserved or not reserved, but rather, you know, first come, first serve. I think the question is not first come, first serve versus, res uh, versus reservation. I think it's first come, first serve and reservation. That is, uh, and, and with Alan's comment kept in mind, I too would hate to see a reservation system lock out any period of time in which first come, first serve would also be possible. So I, I think we need to get parks to define more clearly what the scheduling of the use of handball court of squash courts there will be the handball courts are already first come first serve right and so why, why squash, change the I think people, people uh, should be we may want to have that first i mean it seems that there is a reservation system for the whole city if they extend that it's going to have a different nature so you may just want to say this is not where you may want to to ask it in a strong way, let's put it this way. So it sounds like our preference is to allow for the guild to block out the three uh, afternoons a week uh, and one afternoon, or I believe it's one mid morning on a weekend. And other than that, our preference is pick up first come first serve use of those courts, right? Yeah. yeah. And let them come back and push back. I mean, then. then. Sure. I, no, I think I, that. I don't I, think. And again, this issue came to, was brought to us by Hudson Guild, right? They they were seeking our support to make this change because they're trying to bring this program um, to the folks that go there. Um, so they were looking for our support to make this change. It's it, it's going to be the Parks Department that is the determiner on this. But I think that certainly some, makes a lot of sense that we push that forward in the end. It's important to say that it's an ongoing program for Hudson Guild and they just wanna move it closer to where they are. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, um, Mike, Christine had the last word on that one. So we're gonna move on to ACES. Um, you turn it over to Blake, uh, Jeffrey? Yes, for, uh, let's see, what do we have first? Um, yes, Blake, if you wanna intro, uh, take us through the rat letter. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, first, thanks to Alan and Kit for dedicating the last ACES meeting for two, you know, I think really informative uh, street life presentations that inform letters 12 and 13. Uh, so 12 was on the, the rat problem that, you know, we heard from our neighbors about. So stressing the significance of the problem, both as a public health problem, as well as a quality of life problem, uh, as well as needing to prioritize work on some of the root causes, which have been tied to board priorities. Uh, you know, specifically our support for on-street trash containerization uh, to help remove bags of trash from the sidewalk, uh, so, uh, to remove organics from trash bags, uh, and third, uh, supporting garbage management plans for new buildings, uh, including features like interior trash storage. So since the letter in the Dropbox, uh, I had a couple of friendly amendments. Uh, the first was just mine uh, that I would want to mention the public hearing that we had tonight uh, and our neighbor's concern, you know, with the severity of the rat problem, as well as the urgency of city involvement in the monitoring and extermination. Uh, secondly, uh, from Betty on um, page one, line 26, uh, inclusion of construction uh, as another factor that's associated with the growing rat problem. And on page two, line nine, the identification of uh, a standard on-street trash container design uh, as one of the goals of uh, the on-street trash where you know, we can find a standard container that's effective at rat prevention. Uh, and then from Leslie on page two, uh, line two, uh, to mention, uh, to reiterate the outdoor dining uh, issue where 
you know, if DOT, which is responsible for monitoring the outdoor dining structures, are unable to effectively monitor the rat conditions associated with those structures, uh, we need to further resource the Department of Health uh, to take over inspections of the rat elements of those stalls, uh, which would also have the benefit of consolidating the rat oversight under one agency. So that's letter 12. Uh, and then letter 13 is uh, about uh, Graffiti Free NYC, which is uh, one of the Economic Development Corps programs to provide no cost graffiti removal for privately owned buildings, uh, which can be uh, tapped into by any, any resident calling uh, or using the 311 system. Uh, so we're expressing support for the program, uh, particularly as it's needed for empty storefronts in our neighborhood. Uh, and we make comments on hiring. Uh, we applaud the efforts of the program to hire formerly incarcerated individuals, as well as they've worked with minority and women-owned talent consultants for staffing the program. But we would uh, want the program to consider uh, union labor uh, for the graffiti removal. So any questions on 12 or 13? Thanks, Blake. Leslie, and then Bert. Yeah. It's not a question, it's more of a funny aside. We talked about uh, with the graffiti removal, Blake, I don't know if you remember, during the meeting, I actually put in a request for graffiti removal as we were talking with the EDC and I have not yet heard back and that was a month ago, almost a month ago. So I am just saying, they said it was 48 hours and <laughs> maybe we should put that in the letter because um, there has been no response, but anyway, we'll see. Bert? Yeah, I have, a, I have a question about the next to last paragraph. And you actually mentioned it, like um, that you suggested the EDC use union labor. Now, I don't know if that was just a throwaway line that was inserted with no thought behind it, but I was just wondering if there is thought, what about the consequences of, of union labor and having formerly incarcerated people labor? Um, would people be able to join a union? Would people be able to join the union or work side by side? Any thought about that? Yeah, I think we had supported uh, looking at union hiring uh, in other areas, you know, just for the worker protections that uh, are associated with that. Uh, you know, so I, I don't think it was a throwaway line, but, you know, it was something that had come up at the committee meeting that uh, we had wanted to include. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Blake. Any other questions on these letters? Okay, we will move on uh, to transportation. Uh, Dale, I believe you're presenting on these. Oh, I um, oh, I no, Christine, I'm sorry. This was my, my turn. Sorry. <laughs> Short memory sometimes. Uh, so letter 14 is um, a letter to ESD, which has presented already twice to us on the lighting they want to put under the new extension of the High Line. And the lighting is pretty dramatic bad in the sense that this is really highway lighting when we were asking them pedestrian lighting. So that, that was this letter. I, I, I'd like to make, uh, Betty has done a, a number of clarification and we have accepted those. This is small things. One uh, amendment I'd like to make is that we want to ask, it's complicated because it's the Port Authority, it's DOT, it's CSD. And you know we are getting the runaround. So we, in addition to a meeting with the DOT, we want to ask a meeting with Port Authority to discuss this matter. And so it's that I would make that as an amendment on letter 14. Anybody has any question on, on that letter? Okay, then we're going to bundle 16 to 19. Oh, I'm sorry, 14, 15 to 19. Um, any questions on 15 to 19? Okay. Okay. And, uh, item 20 has been tabled. And right? l l yeah, item 20 has been uh, tabled. We'll put it on next next month because of COVID related uh, crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Carrie, 
Questions on the letter? Sorry for the late question. Um, on 18 okay. for snow removal, I'm wondering, um, was there any consideration of uh, the outdoor dining sheds and snow removal and should it be mentioned in the letter? I'm, I'm, I'm sort of wondering if these outdoor dining sheds should be mentioned in every single letter we write, um, just so we start to really kind of well pressure, no, pressure conversation around them. So this is a letter which is going to sanitation in the letter, we are talking about bike lane and having narrow and small uh, removal, you know, small um, uh, trucks. Uh, yeah. So that takes care of that because otherwise the enforcement of the, the measurements for the outdoor dining is going to be DOT. And we know they are not doing it because I've raised to them yes, about yes. five or 10 of them and they are not doing it. I think they are waiting for a message from... Uh, Adams to say go do it you know and so um, I can I can emphasize that a little further if you want I mean I just think it would be it, it you know again it adds to the complexity of snow removal right uh, yeah. among you know the rat problem and the and you yeah, know liquor we'll, licensing we'll, and everything that we're <laughs> I'll like, put a sentence about that in there we'll put a thank sentence. you and yeah. I just had one other quick question about that same letter um is there any uh was there any conversation around potentially requesting uh and I don't know enough about this so I'm just throwing this out there with with no education um some kind of environmentally friendly snow removal like do we know whether or not what they use right now is um is well, right now they use essentially uh, equipment and they have a de-icing, you know, a de-icing program. And the purpose of that letter is to say, are you treating the pedestrian, you know, and the cyclist the same way you treat cars? And what is the priority of those removals? Um, so we may want to open that discussion, but do it later. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank Thanks, Kerry. Marty. Thank you. I I have a a concern about seventeen. Uh, we um, received the benefit. I'm being sarcastic of a city uh, bike installation in front of uh, on Eighth Avenue in in front of our building, uh, blocking easy drop off, um, and and so the the thing that. Uh, Carrie's question raised about another letter uh, is the, the use of street space for city bike and the use of street space for restaurants is in no way being coordinated. Uh, there, there is a helter-skelter grab of gutter space. And um, I don't know how to solve that. I don't think the community board can solve that, but at least we should be conscious that uh, these things are competing. And I don't think we have an overall position ourselves of how we want street space to be used. It's, it's an excellent point and so timely because at the next meeting of transportation, we're going to start that discussion about the curb, curbside use and creating an overall framework to make decisions. So we're going to work on that next, uh, start working on that on the next meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Twee? Uh, hi, Catherine, maybe you've already answered this just now, but I'm trying to understand also with item 17, number two, 8th Avenue and West 23rd Street West Roadbed. That means it's located on 20, on 8th Avenue? When it's like, how does that location work? What does that mean, West Broadbed? Yeah, it's on 8th Avenue. Okay, because currently there is a bike lane and you're saying that's where you're all trying to figure out the No, curve. it's going to be on the floating parking lane, which is along the bike lane. It is on the floating, floating parking, lane, parking right. lane. And it was moved from a wide sidewalk that was on the other side of a east side of 8th Avenue uh, because uh, of, I don't know, whatever objections that were made for its location there and imposed on the residential building. Okay, so this will be in front of 
Um, it exists now. Excuse me? It, it's there now. I think you are talking about two different things. There is one proposed at 23rd, and Marty, you are talking about 26th, aren't you? 20, 27th. And 27th, 27th and 8th. Right. So there will be two different ones. Yeah. Yes, I'm talking about number two, Marty, um, 8th Avenue and West 23rd. Um, so that's. So you, got, you got, so the answer is it's going to be on the floating land. Okay. okay. Hector. Thank you. Um, just to follow up the Twee's comment there, uh, 8th Avenue and West 23rd, um, there's actually a bike dock there right there on 22nd. Isn't that a little too redundant? Um, no, I mean, what they, are do what they are doing is they are, they have a software which is looking at the demand right. on each of the station and yeah. based on the demand and the fact that it's the demand exceeds in enormously the supply, they are, you know, adding those stations right in the vicinity. So that's, that's what it looks like there is a need because people want to take it and they are empty or people want to park and it's full. And, and so that's what they are doing. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. Uh, I think a more appropriate uh, approach to this, though, is the way they're managing the, the docks, because I take city bike quite often, and I'm sure there's uh, many people have run into, there are no docks available usually when you get to your destinations. So, um, and I have two docks literally perpendicular to each other, uh, a total of maybe 40 stations, and yet Times I can't get a dock, and I've called city bike on this, and this happened. This happens throughout the city. No, but I think I think it's it's this addition. These additions are in response to your comment and the comment of everybody saying we need more space. When we arrive at the station, we want to be able to dock, and when there is no place to dock, you need to have more station. No, I agree, but I, I think basically they're not managing it properly either. The way they're rotating the uh, the bikes in and out. Um, honestly, because it, it's it's really deplorable when you have so many docks in the immediate vicinity and you can't get a bike dock, you know, when you when you come home late at night. So it's it's kind of insane. Okay, Bjorn. Bjorn. Yeah, very very quickly. It might have been covered. And just a quick um, sort of not exactly a suggestion, but one of the problems when the snow removal takes place and when the you know plows sort of push the snow against the sidewalk. Uh, how do we sort of make sure that the curb cuts are cleared? Can we include some language to that effect? Well, it is in the letter because we tell them that they need to change the way the, the, the um, what is it called? The, the, I can't remember the name of the, the front. They need to organize the, the, the front of the, the truck to be pushing out from the curb wow. instead of against the curb. So it's in the letter. Right. What I, was, what I was suggesting, Christine, is that because of the manner in which the plows actually work, they typically push the snow against the sidewalk. But I'm just saying we are asking no, no, no. What them I'm not is, to do that. I know. What I'm say, suggesting is that there might be a secondary way of actually clearing the curb cuts, and that might not be achieved. Okay, we are course. also asking that in the letter. Okay. We're asking them when they start to clear the curb cut and, and at what time they start that process, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for transportation? Leslie, final question on these letters, folks. Yeah, it's not even, it's not even really a question. I don't know who, who wrote um, the 19 DoorDash uh, letter. That is an awesome letter, Dale. It is so proactive. I gotta tell you, because we talk about it all the time and it is, this is like, how other I think CBs can look. It's being proactive. It's knowing what's going to go on with, you know, when someone, when a business promises 10 minutes to your door and then everything that could be in the fallout after that. So I read it and I was like, spot on, whoever wrote it, Dale, good job. I thought and by the way, we have a new one on Ninth Avenue. Well, we really wanted to meet with DoorDash, but they didn't yeah. come to our meeting. So no, I, you, yeah. I mean, you make it perfectly clear. Like, not only do you <laughs> ask them to meet, but you, you lay out every point. Yeah. I thought it was. I thought it was really great. I you think we should all. Thank you. I think we should all prepare ourselves for something of a frenzy yeah, because exactly. it's a venture capital funded push to dominate the space of fast delivery services in our city and other cities. 
So it's going to be a little hellish for a while on this front. And, yeah. you know, it's also our own demand is creating it, much like the Amazon trucks and the, and the packages. We are creating this demand, but guess what we're going to get? We're going to get a bike delivery free-for-all in the coming months. Yeah. I mean, you hit it spot. It, it was great. Thanks, yeah, all these letters are, uh, it's not, the whole team is doing it and Dale and I, Dale is doing a lot, of, is writing a lot of them and helping me with the others. So it's a real team effort. Yes, we are a very consensus driven committee. <laughs> that is true. Um, thank you, Christine. Thank you, okay. Dale. Uh, there is no other business, any new business. Okay, uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to our co-secretaries to run the roll call of the vote this evening. Blake and Katie. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna read the names, uh, you know, same as usual, last name, alphabetical, descending, and Katie has the hard job of tracking the votes. So uh, first is Sarah Appleton. Blake, can I, before we start, can I just remind everybody they must submit this vote sheet as well? Thank you. And Jesse, can you I just sent you a note. I can't find um, from today's email the link to the vote sheet apologies. So no worries. if there's a way to send it out back out, that'd be great. Sorry about that. I will. If everybody can take a pause, Blake, Blake and Katie. Um, it was done at 1.47 p.m., Dolores, 1.47. Looking, thank you. Yeah, 1.46. Jesse, can you remind me what item, transportation item was tabled? 20. Okay, thank you, Christine. All right, I'll, I'll get started on the list. So Sarah Appleton. Um, yeah, yes on all except present but not eligible on 19. Ted Arenas. Yes to all. Roberta. Yes to all. Christine. Yes to all and voted. Gwen. Yes to all. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Murphy. Yes to all. Viren. Viren. Yes to all. Jessica. You lose Jessica. Was here. I can come circle back. back. I know she was here. Let me text her. Dale. I'm yes to all and I voted. Marty. Yes to all and the survey was submitted. All. All Dublin. Yes to all and submitted. Excuse me, I voted no on 17. Yes to all the others. Got it. Thanks. Tina. Yes, to all, we'll submit shortly. Pete. Pete Diaz. Yes, to all, and submit it. Thank you. Tina. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Sorry. Sorry. Yes, to all. Sorry about that, Tina Nelson. Uh, Elzora. Wendy. Yes to all and submitted. Jesse. Yes to all and submitted. Candace. David Holokwa. Frank. Yes to all and submitted. Josephine. Yes to all. Peggy. Yes to all and submitted. Carrie. Yes to all and, and submitted. Lowell. Hi. 
I'm next. Uh, yes to all. Bert. Yes to all. Chris. Yes Chris. to all submitted. Thanks. Jeffrey, or do we actually come back to Jeffrey, right? Yeah, that yes. was how it was done, I think. Yep. Okay. Betty. Yes to all. Sarah Mills. Yes to all and submitted. Mike Noble. Yes to all and submitted. JD. Yes to all. Maria. Yes to all and submitted. Alan. Yes to all and submitted. Brad. Abstain on 19, yes to the rest. Thank you. Twee. No on number two, yes to the rest. And I'm submitting now. Joe. Joe Rastusha. I didn't see him tonight. He's, not, he's, 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 he's in trouble. Actually, sorry, just real quickly, Brad, can you tell me again which one you were abstaining on? Abstaining on, on 19. 19. Yeah. Thank you. DoorDash. Sabrina. Yes, to all and submit it. Dolores. Present not eligible on 14. Yes to the rest. David Solney. David Solnick here, he's here. He's right here. Um, I can come back. Mm -hmm. Kate. Yes to all. Kit. Hector. Yes to all and submit it. Renal. Yes, you all and submit it. Rob Walker. Yes to all and submit it. James Wallace. Happy New Year. Yes to all. <laughs> and I have submitted the vote form. And welcome, Jeffrey. You're doing a great job. And thank you, Jesse. You rock. <laughs> David Warren. Yay to all and submit it. Leslie Williams. Yes to all, and I'll submit right now. And Alice Wong. Yes to all, and submitted. And <laughs> the other names. Uh, so, Jessica. Yes to all, and submitted. Sorry for getting kicked off. I'm uh, not sure if Elzora is here. Uh, Elzora's not here today. And David Holokwa. Lowell, uh, Joe, David Solnick. Yes to all. That was David Solnick? Yeah. Yeah. And um, Jeffrey. I am present, not eligible on number one, and yes to the rest, and submitted. Great, I think that's the list. Great, um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Bravo, bravo. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Um, good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.